Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, we did not start the state space models. Actually, Albert had sent for that, but we built the math just. So I, I don't want Albert to jump at me and say I took credit for it. <laughs> uh, work. Um, just a little bit high level. Yeah, so this is um, this presentation was done within like um, our like assistant team. Uh, GDM, but also with like a bunch of external people like uh, Chalar, Albert, and, and Antonio. Um, and um, even the slides themselves, they're uh, built based on a tutorial we gave. So some of the slides I actually have not made. I just kind of steal from, from these folks and, and put them together. Uh, so yeah, just to give credit to people who actually worked on this. Um, yeah, so um, there's a there's a bit of hype around now around SSMs. Um, so you know people are quite interested in this um, recurrent models. Um, they seem to perform surprisingly well, particularly on language, which is a, a domain that people actually care quite a bit about. Uh, but but they're also useful in other uh, spaces. And um, recently, you know, like in Vision, people have started using more and more SSMs. So there's like a, a video Mamba a image and, and video. So video Mamba is the recent one. And there's a vision Mamba and V Mamba and all kinds of variants. Um, people have applied this to biological data and it seems to kind of work quite well. And in this talk, I'm, I'm going to present a little bit sort of our flavor of these models that we've been working on and also try to explain a little bit of like how we think at the moment that they're actually working. Um, and I'll, I'll start with a little bit of uh, historical context and a bit of theory about recurrent neural networks and SSMs and then after that, I'll, I'll try to move more into like engineering and, and pragmatic aspects of how to get these models to, to work at scale. Um, so I wanted to start with a bit of historical context because I, I find it fun, um, in particular because um, language is the domain I'm, I'm focusing on. I, I wanted to give a bit of context to like statistical learning approaches to, to learning. Um, so it's kind of very nice hi um, history there. And I think there is, um, probably like some kind of uh, cycle pattern coming in. I, I haven't put that on, but it's so mostly my opinion, but sort of where we started was like in the 50s and um, in this kind of yellow box, uh, it's it's an actual review from, from back then. So I, I stole this from Kuyum Cho. Um, so this was a review to a paper that was trying to use statistical learning to the translation. And, and the reviewer was saying something like, well, you know, since the 40s, people have looked at statistical learning for language and it's just a bad idea and you should never consider this and you know brute force is never the answer to anything and like this is you know we should not encourage this kind of research so this is where we started in the 50s and then when we end up in the 80s we have people like uh, Fred uh, Jelinek from IBM and that was the place to be at that point in time who said you know every time I fire a linguist the performance of our model goes up and you know we should not <laughs> use linguists and, and I think you know, now we need linguistics again because we got to a point where, well, we have these models that seem to work, but we don't actually understand what they're doing. And maybe linguistics might be the way of actually evaluating and understanding them. But it's it's interesting how sort of the opinion of people change over time so drastically. Um, and then sort of for a bit of uh, context of where neural networks fit in this history. So they kind of people have started looking at language and, and, and neural networks in the 90s. Um, and this was usually done through um, feed forward models. So we have like the, the paper from Joshua back then, which is one of the, um, among the, the first papers that were looking at this kind of stuff. Um, and, and the way this worked is you would look at language and you would make this nth order Markov assumption. So you'd assume that you only need the last n tokens to be able to predict the next one. And this was done out of necessity. So the point was like for these feed forward models, they need to have a fixed length input and we did not know how to deal with variable lengths. So, so that's why you need to fix an N and you say, okay, this is the number of tokens that you can look back into. And it was also for, um, because of computational reason and also like learnability issues. So like we, we thought back then that this is the kind of thing, the only kind of thing we can do with neural networks. So just, to, and, and also like the N grams were, were like a good um, precursor to this, that, that kind of reinforced this perspective that this is, this is a good choice. But even back then we had um, an alternative, which were recurrent neural networks. Um, and then like the talk of, uh, it's about recurrent neural networks. So it's like how, how we got back to them. Uh, so what happened with recurrent neural networks? So um, this is, the history is partially inspired by um, Jürgen Schmidtuber's long paper about the history of everything, but I've done some adaptation to so how, how I see things. But you know, according to Jürgen, like things starts from the 1925, well, maybe a bit later than that. But the point is, recurrent neural networks kind of emerged at the same time as feed-forward models, um, and this is basically because a lot of neural network 
literature was inspired from neuroscience and in the brain there is a lot of recurrence so it was natural to think of like okay we need to have this recurrence um and and the main issue with these models was um how to train them so there was some work in the 80s and the 90s uh, from people like amari and so forth that developed backcrop through time but overall uh learning of recurrent neural networks is difficult and this is became even more apparent sort of in the early 90s when you have works like Jurgen Schmidtuber's um, and then Joshua Benjo that talks about this uh, exploding vanishing radiant problem that everyone knows. These are sort of the prototypical issues with training recurrent neural networks. Uh, so they were seen as a, a very interesting architecture that is hard to train, even though technically we know how to write the algorithm for them, like backdrop to time. And, you know, it's not just backdrop to time. We have RTRL and all these other algorithms. Um, but on the pro side, you know, we have works like the work from Hava Siegelman that show that these recurrent models are extremely expressive. So not only they don't need to make this ad order Markov assumption, uh, Hava showed that the recurrent neural network is Turing complete. So ideally, it can emulate any kind of algorithm you'd want. Um, and, and, and this sort of creates this sort of pressure of, oh, we need to get sort of recurrent neural networks working. And then there's sort of the ideal model to, to model sequential data and to model sort of complex data like, like language. Um, and it took a long time for us to figure out how to do that. So there's a bunch of work that I'm not going to talk about, but like roughly in 97, you know, LSCM popped up from, from uh, Cochrane and Schmidhuber, and it took up to 2014 for people to actually acknowledge this architecture and see that it actually works at scale. So basically no one was able to properly train them at scale and show that they work. But in 2014, you, you get... Uh, um, LSTM working at scale, and then they become the de facto tool to be used in language modeling. And you have works like sequence to sequence, uh, paper from like Oriol and Ilya and um, Park Lee, I think. Um, and then, you know, you have like the translation of Google at that point, transition to like the uh, LSTM kind of architecture and so forth. So it became kind of the de facto model until 2017, maybe 2018, when it was taken over by. Um, uh, by transformers, um, and um, yeah, and now we're trying to get them back to be there. And then, sort of the high level, what are the pros and the um, and the negatives of, of trying to use recurrent neural networks? So I think on the on like a, a positive fact about recurrent neural networks is they're very a, a very natural formalism to deal with sequential data. So they're natural and they're also quite compact. Um, you have this um, connection to neuroscience and you know. You know that that people sometimes find quite quite exciting that we know that the brain is recurrent, so it feels like that's an important property. They have fast inference, so every time you need to uh, predict something, you just you know you don't need to look back at your history because the way the recurrent neural network works is it creates this compressed representation of everything that you've seen so far in the hidden state. So every time you see a new observation, you're basically compressing that in the hidden state, and the hidden state is now like a summary of everything that you've seen. And when you need to make a prediction, you just need that summary. You don't need the whole sequence anymore. And then you have this very nice expressivity results, like it's provable, Turing complete, and so forth. But then there is some like negative, there is a negative side of that, right? So one is training stability. So we have this exploding uh, vanishing gradient that's been partially resolved with things like gradient clipping and gating and so forth, but it's still there um, and, and it's still creating an issue. And for people who play with these systems, they'll see that sometimes it's harder to, they're more sensitive to hyperparameters than, than, than a feedforward system. Um, the big, a big, a big issue nowadays is scalability, and I would say that nowadays, you know, when it comes to architecture design, scalability is probably the one thing that dominates in sort of when you make a choice of what architecture you're going to use. So um, training a, an LSTM is probably like 20x lower than training a transformer, because, and the reason for that is because the the the, the recurrent is inherently sequential. So in order to process a sequence, you have to go one token at a time and go forward in time and just process that entire sequence while the transformer can parallelize all of this computation. So if you have enough devices, you can just uh, compute everything in parallel and, and then that's why you're, you're way faster at training at least. Um, and then there's some expressivity bottlenecks that you can see as a plus or a minus, and I'm not going to talk too much about them, but I thought it's, it's, it's worth highlighting them because I don't actually have papers to point at them, but I think it's a nice hypothesis for people if they kind of get excited about this kind of thing. So one thing is about sort of the, the Turing completeness. So first of all, like the way the neural network works is they have to compress everything into this hidden state. You can see this as a plus or a minus. So in terms of a minus, because you have this information bottleneck, you have to compress everything into the hidden state, 
when you have to do exact retrieval, when you have this kind of task where you ask the system, well, can you tell me the phone number of X that you've seen, I don't know, like a billion tokens ago, then RNN obviously cannot deal with this kind of tasks because it has to compress everything in the hidden state and can't compress everything. While a transformer basically has access, at least in theory, to the entire previous sequence and you can search through it and find that phone number for you. So, so there is, that's the negative. The positive is, well, compression equals generalization. So, so maybe there is something to be gained here. And um, I'm just going to leave that out there. But like for, for people who like this, you know, they know that like one way to think of generalization is just compression. And the fact that the system compressed seems to be like a plus there. Um, and the other thing is uh, on the optimization side in terms of expressivity, when you have this like tuning completeness stuff, but if you think about like what kind of recurring neural networks you get if you train them by gradient descent, because of the stability issues, you tend to get recurrence where the, the mapping from T to T plus one is a contraction. Um, and I believe, I don't have a proof for this, but I believe that that means that the system you can reach by gradient descent, those are those don't, don't are not very complete because you can only uh, model contractions and you know in order to be Turing complete you also need to be able to move outside of this um, so so you know like I think it's one needs to be careful when they make this um, I have seen this a lot you know like the, the the people working on expressivity versus people that work on things like how you know how to optimize or how to learn models they don't tend to work together and a lot of expressivity results they don't take into account issues that might arise from gradient descent and I believe that this kind of uh, doing completeness proof they're proved by construction and they rely on kinds of architectures that you, but I, I believe you can't reach by by gradient descent. So, so, so I think that's that's something worth keeping in mind. Um, okay, so now what what about state space models? This new uh, family of models. Well, the, the, in my view, and th this is not how they were originally introduced, but in my view, they're just recurrent neural networks that are trying to fix two issues with the typical RNNs that we had before that, like LSTMs and GRUs and so forth. So one. They're trying to make training stable, and this is maybe a bit more implicit in, in the work that have been published, but it's definitely one thing that they bring to the table. And the other thing is they try to make uh, training scalable. So they try to make training as fast as it is for transformers. Um, and this is sort of at a glance, you know, this, this kind of space exploded a little bit. So it kind of started in 2020 with the HIPPO paper from, from Albert Gu and uh, Christopher Ray, and then there was like, you know, more and more papers exploding. Um, and, and what's the big idea behind them? Well, the big idea is to start from the transformer block that we typically have. So this is this is meant to be a transformer block. It might not look like one, but it's meant to be a transformer block. So you start with something like a transformer block and you just replace the attention with this kind of SSM layer. So that's how they work. And then they, they plug this into all kinds of tasks and they get very interesting results. Um, so, okay, so just what what how how does this SSM layer actually look at? So I think a lot of the literature actually focuses on the SSM layer, not as much on the block. As we'll see at the, at later in the talk, actually the block matters a, a lot as well. And if you remove the block and you just look at the layer, it's not as, as as interesting as you might think. But like, how does this SSM layers look exactly? So the inspiration comes from control theory, and I don't know much about control theory, but there is state-based models, I think, from the 50s in control theory, and I guess in statistics as well, and these are continuous time systems. <laughs> and in the SSM literature, you, you consider this kind of continuous um, uh, time or continuous state-based models, um, and you use a deterministic initialization for them. Um, and then that's sort of like what the HIPPO paper did. So the HIPPO paper basically proposed a way of, of setting up the matrix A, B, C, or actually A, that's the only matrix you need to think about. Uh, they, they proposed a way of how to initialize, how to, to set up matrix A in such a way that this system compressed the sequence optimally, and this is the HIPPO initialization. And then in order to actually use these models in practice in machine learning, what you do is you have to discretize them. And once you've discretized them, you get something that looks like a recurring neural network. Uh, okay, so <laughs> kind of repeating myself, but uh, you know, this is sort of the, the continuous time perspective of the system. So how does it work is you, you have this ODE formulation where X is your state and you know, you say X prime equals, and you have, it has this linear form AXT plus BU. Um, and then the first step that you need to do in order to, to make this work is now you need to discretize it. And here you have a choice. So how do you, you know, like your choice of discretization. Um, and if you look in the literature, like different uh, proposed archi architectures use different kinds of discretizations. 
so for example, the formula here is the one used in the original S4 paper, which used the, the bilinear method to, to, dis, to discretize. And then you get basically something that just looks like a recurrent uh, model. So this SK equals A bar XK minus one plus B UK. So this is the, the for, for people who are familiar with recurrence, this is your, you know, your form of recurrence with the caveat that A bar has this very awkward form that depends on the discretization step delta and you know, it has some inverse and some all kinds of stuff. And if you choose a different discretization, you get equally ugly formula out of it. <laughs> but in the end, the same thing. So, that, um, so this is how it works. And then the question is, how do you how do you initialize this model? How do you start them? So this is where the HIPPO uh, matrix paper uh, comes in. And it says, well, there is a particular way of initializing A, which is this formula above. And this comes from um, uh, polynomial approximation theory. So this makes sure that the, um, so, so it, it, it's trying to solve this recurrent formula at the bottom. And I'm going to go into the details, but this kind of, if you think about what it wants to do is to say that the hidden units of your recurrence, so your hidden state, those are the coefficients of a polynomial that has a degree the size of your hidden uh, state that best approximates the sequence that you're seeing. So that's kind of what a HIPPO matrix is trying to do. It's trying to find a recursive way to find these coefficients that would give you the best polynomial fit to, to the sequence that you're seeing. And um, yeah, and then and this as well, um, that the your system is going to be very good at compressing or representing the sequence itself. It's going to be a good representation of the sequence. And then, um, then, the, the, then you know, the, the, the last part of this is, okay, now how do you use the model? So we already shown how this looked. Um, so, so basically, the, in the literature, you SSMs have been treated in two ways, either as a recurrence or as a convolution. And actually, the initial paper, they were claiming that what you want to do is a training time to work with them as a convolution because that parallelizes very well and we know contents work well. And then a test time you use it as a recurrence because then you get this O1 inference cost that's kind of very fast. So um, um, yeah, so then if you use it as a recurrent network, you have exactly this. So the only maybe important bit here is that when you train or you work with the systems, the matrices that you're actually learning is A and B um, and, and delta maybe. So you always have to do this thing of like, you know, inverting and um, blah, 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 to, to actually get the matrix that you apply in practice. So, you know, you're, you're not learning directly A bar and B bar, because if you do that, that would just be a normal recurrent that you're learning this in. Yeah. So what do you mean with the recurrent form or convolutional form and you can use both? Yeah. So, so if you want to find out what is XK, uh, in, in, in a recurrent form, you just apply this recurrent. So you compute your A bar, your B bar, and then you can apply this uh, as a recurrence. If you want, oh, oh, I skip two slides. You can also rewrite this, and you can see that actually you can rewrite Y as being a convolution with a particular kernel where the kernel has this form that takes C, A to different powers, I. So this is like an infinitely wide kernel. So if you have an interesting way of computing this kernel, then now you can rewrite the whole your thing as a, as a convolution instead of a recurrence. That's the basic, I guess, what I meant. Um, yeah, so one thing that the literature kind of emphasizes quite a bit when it comes to the recurrent form is that because the system is linear, you can use um, associative scans. So this is work from the 90s. So it shows that you can rewrite this linear recurrence uh, in, a, in an associative way. And this formula here is trying to show you how that formula looks. But the point then is if you use, if you rewrite it like this, then you can take your sequence, you can split it into chunks, you can compute them in parallel, and then there's a way of composing all of these results to get the exactly correct answer at the end. So you don't have to go to the sequence um, sequentially. You can compute in parallel because uh, it's all linear operations, so you can exploit associativity in, in, in these operations. Um, and then there's the kernel form that is just kind of highlighting that you can rewrite Y as just being the convolution of this special kernel. Um, but of course, this kernel is in a function of A bar, B bar, C bar. So then there's a question of how do you compute this kernel? And then, you know, if you look in the papers, you get little snippets like this that I'm not going to go into detail, but in general, they all look ugly. Uh, you know, you have to do some inverse, you need to do some kind of, um, you need to apply some Fourier transform at some point and then move between the spaces to, to kind of get sort of efficiently to get these computations done. Um, and um, yeah, at the high level, when we started looking at this, I mean, I, I guess sort of this was our perspective, right? So we have this high level of what the SSM literature is about. Um, I, I don't have a lot of uh, 
control theory background. So for me, all of this just looked ugly and complex, and I didn't know where to start and what to do and what all of those terms meant. Um, and then you have a lot of choices, which is also quite, quite frustrating, right? There's many variants of these SSMs. Um, you have multiple choices of discretization. The choice you make matters a lot. So if you just switch the type of discretization that you do, you can get a system that was working to not work at all. Um, so, so it matters and it's not clear why, because these discretizations are supposed to approximate the same thing. Um, and then if you go to more modern architectures, I believe, particularly I think for Mamba potentially, I think the discretization step is not even exact anymore. There's like some approximations there that it's not clear why you can make it and what does it mean to throw out some part of the, the discretization. Um, and it's not clear whether it's this sort of layer and all of this theory that comes into this layer that matters, or is the fact that you're using the transformer block around it that made things work. So we wanted to disentangle a little bit things and we wanted to understand what's going on. And uh, this is sort of where we started. This was an internship project of Antonio that ended up in a paper that, that I was quite, quite excited about. And the idea there was like, okay, let's go back to the transformer block. We take out the, the attention. Let's replace it by vanilla RNN. So this would be very traditional vanilla uh, you know, RNN with like a sigmoid of uh, you know, simple RNN. And then from this, start moving more and more towards SSMs and see how far do we need to move for this thing to start working again. Um, I'm going to just start skip a bit because I think I'm moving too slowly. So the first step that we found out that is quite important to start getting good numbers is to get rid of the nonlinearity. Uh, and this can be somewhat counterintuitive um, for people who are like used to recurrent neural networks because you you know the nonlinearity helps you create a system that's quite expressive. You know, like if you get rid of the nonlinearity and it's a linear system, you can't model things complicated things. So the first question you ask yourself is like, okay, it seems that if I drop the nonlinearity, I get better numbers, but is this system expressive? Is can can you do interesting things? You know, why does it work? Um, so I don't think we have a very deep answer, but uh, one thing that you can show, and we did this, and, and maybe it's a bit trivial, but anyway, is that you can show that if you have a linear RNN that is followed by the MLP, then you can recover the, the expressivity power. Um, and this is because you can think of it as you're um, doing a separation of concerns. So basically, if you can show that the linear RNN can compress the sequence, in such a way that at time t you can decode all previous observations, then any kind of nonlinearity can be taken care of by the MLP on top. So the only, you know, the MLP is the universal approximator. The only thing it needs is to be able to retrieve any of the previous observation from your uh, hidden state. And then your question simplifies of okay, you know, what can, how well can linear recurrences compress things? And, and there's theory about this, and there's good knowledge about this, and you can come up with nice bounds. You can, I mean, obviously, if you say the hidden state is infinitely wide, then it becomes trivial. Of course, I can compress everything and I can represent everything. Um, if, you, if it's not infinite, then, then you come up with bounds and it matters of the length of the sequence and stuff like this. But you can show that, you know, uh, uh, you know, you, you can get a sense of how you gain back the expressivity. So, and, and you can get a sense of like, what is the role of, 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 the, of the linear RNN? And this maps very well with the SSM literature because the HIPPO matrix was all about this, right? The HIPPO matrix was all about coming up with the right uh, hidden state that would give me, you know, would allow me to reconstruct everything that I've seen so far. Um, okay, so, so, so linear RNN could work if they're embedded within this block that has MLPs and if you can repeat this structure many times. By the way, another observation that maybe it's of interest is, I don't know how many of you guys play with LSTMs, but if you try to make a deep LSTM, so you start stacking LSTMs, actually you don't gain much. You know, two layer LSTM is better than one, but then if you go to four or five, there's nothing to gain. For these things is exact is not the same, right? Like you go to six layers and you still gain if you stack more. And this is just because every block is not as expressive. Like you really gain expressivity through stacking. Like the, the stacking, the, the depth does a lot of work. And that, that's kind of the idea of this as a sense, right? You make the recurrence simple and then you gain back expressivity by stacking many of them with, with the similar piece in between. Yeah? Quick question, like do you mean uh Stacking the MLP like together. Yeah, yeah. So it's linear and NMLP, linear and NMLP, linear and NMLP. Not just the linear layers. No, if you just stack linear recurrence one after the other, you can collapse them into one. The same as three. So you need the MLPs in between. Um, okay, but then what do you gain if you switch to linear RNNs? So there are two things that people usually point out. 
So one is the parallelization that we talked before. So because it's linear now, you can use this associativity property. So you can parallelize your computation using something like associative scan, which is readily available in PyTorch, I think, and in JAX and other places. The other thing is you can diagonalize the system. And, and if you diagonalize the system, so you, because you can make your, you know, you do like an SVD decomposition of A and you can push the S and D into the input weights and the output weights, and you just left to the diagonal matrix in the middle. If you do that, basically now in your recurrence, you have an, a vector vector multiplication, you know, like an LMWise multiplication of vectors, which is much more efficient. So you saved a lot of compute. That's one thing, and usually that's the thing that people point out. The other thing that I mean, I think people point out, but you know, I, I like a lot more and I emphasize a lot more is you get a lot, uh, you get basically, you can control the system at this point. So, so the thing is, um, because this is a linear system, the eigenvalues of the recurrence tells you a lot about how the system behaves. Um, and if it's diagonal, the eigenvalues are just the elements on the diagonal. So you have direct access to them and you can see the eigenvalues and you can do with them whatever you want. Um, okay, so this is just sort of a, yeah, diagonal linear and then are fast. Uh, you get like a, you basically get sort of the speed up you get from transformers like 14x. So now about control, controllability. So one way to think about the system is to say what happens if I feed in like a, an impulse into the system and I want to see how this evolves over time, right? And, and then what you can see is that the magnitude of the eigenvalue um, controls uh, like how whether the, the, the system shrinks over time, you know, if it uh, vanishes over time, you know, and close towards zero, or whether it explodes towards infinity, or if the eigenvalue is exactly one, it stays the same. So, so this gives you like direct sense of you know, when you want memory, like, okay, how, how long, you know, how for how long is some information going to stay in the system? Well, the eigenvalue will tell you exactly that. You know, it's like a decay rate. You can measure, you know, how much of that information will still, still be there after a certain amount of time. Um, and the other thing, because, you know, we're talking about some sort of complex eigenvalues, you also have, so they're not just acting as decaying and expanding, like you also have uh, uh, sort of, um, uh, if you plot them like this uh, frequency, so they, you know they look like sine waves, and you can control the frequency of the signals. And I might say a few more words about it. But then, like if we go back to the usual stability issues, like vanishing, exploding gradient problems, they're, they're all about these eigenvalues. Um, the issue with nonlinear system is that you care about the eigenvalues of the Jacobian, which is something you never have access to because the Jacobian depends on the input. But because the system is linear. The Jacobian is the same as the it's just W transpose, so it's the same weight matrix. So you actually have control over the exact eigenvalues of the Jacobian you care about. And in particular, because it's diagonal, you can parameterize the system so those eigenvalues stay within the unit disk, which is what you want for the system to be stable. Um, and in particular, this is kind of the parameterization we use, the X of minus ReLU, uh, real part plus I imaginary part. And if you do a bit of math, and I hope this math is correct. I have some math that is wrong later in the slide, but I hope this one is correct. But if you do the math, it turns out that this will lead to um, eigenvalues that have magnitude below one. Um, and now you don't need to worry about anything. You know, you do HGD, but you know HGD will never push you outside of the unit disk because by parameterization, it can't do that. But the other thing that this thing gives you is a good sense of how long information stays in the system. So you can just look at decay rates for different values. Um, and it gives you a good sense of how to initialize the model, right? You can either just look at the signal and say, oh, you know, I want to keep information for this long, or it just give you a sense of like what you want to do. And in particular, the way we tend to initialize eigenvalues is we just decide on an R max and R mean, and then we have this ring and we say, well, you know, we want not to vanish too fast, but, you know, it has to be somewhat below one. And then you just randomly sample within this uh, ring uh, the eigenvalues that you want. Um, yeah, so there is this um, thing that because these are complex numbers, you know, you get sort of this kind of uh, oscillation, so you get sort of the frequency of these things. Um, and I think what we, what we noticed in practice is that if this oscillation is too fast, um, then basically you don't make use of the fact that you have complex numbers. So the way you can think about these complex numbers, say, say you just think you have like a, an impulse that you give a time t, and this is all like a, a real value, right? This is only the real part. You, every time you multiply with the complex number, you can think of it as basically you're rotating in a complex plane. So the information flows from the real part, the imaginary part, and then from the imaginary part back to the real part. So you're kind of rotating things. So if you're moving too fast in that circle, basically if you do like a full rotation in, in one time step, that then basically you're not exploiting the fact that you have this space to encode information. So you want that rotations to be somewhat slow so you can actually use this um, this thing. And 
we found this in practice that you know it's it's nice not to sample on the ring, but you have this sort of small corner where the where the frequencies are not too too fast. Um, Okay, so there were six steps. So this is the fifth step of the things that are important to get these things to work. The, I mean, this is not super important, but then the fifth step, like the other thing that you notice, and if you look at decay rates, is the difference between 0 0.99 and 0 0.995 is quite big. The difference between 0.1 and 0.5 is, is almost nothing because of how exponential decay works, right? So what this tells you is that when you're learning these values of the eigenvalues, you have you want to have a lot of resolution close to one because any small change matters a lot, and you don't want to have resolution when you're close to zero because it doesn't matter. Um, and then sort of it's up to you how to make this happen. So one way to make this happen is to use this double exponential. So this double exponential that we use here just basically expands the space to give you that additional resolution around one. So this is. One other trick that you use, you can, you know, this is not necessarily, but it's quite useful to, to get the system to learn better. And the other, the last thing that we did was to realize that actually a lot of what we've done is under the assumption that you give an impulse at time zero and then you let the system go for a long time. But usually you have the input all the time, right? So now you, you, you need to, what you really would want is if you, you know, if you push this, like if you run the system for like an infinite amount of time and you keep Push, pushing input from some distribution, you want the, the, the states to be finite. You know, you don't want them to explode to infinity. Um, and for this, you need to regularize the, the norm of the input because uh, with respect to the eigenvalue, right? So if the eigenvalue is, uh, like if you're keeping track of every, say if eigenvalue is one and you're not forgetting anything, then obviously if you keep adding numbers, you know, those will blow to infinity. So how do you normalize? Well, you need to make some assumptions on the input, and we made some assumptions here that are completely unreasonable. So this is that the um, inputs are uncorrelated, the time steps are uncorrelated, and then you work through the math, and then you get the formula. Now, for, formula is this, uh, you need to normalize this input by square of one minus eigenvalue squared. Um, and yeah, so this is assumes that the, that the input has uh, zero mean, but um, uh, I think, uh, that, uh, Variance one, and that's where this formula comes. Um, okay, so uh, summary. So what did we, when we looked at this, what we found out is that the reason SSMs work really well is because they're exploiting the linearity and, uh, and the fact that it's diagonal, and this is exploited to uh, make this, uh, parameterize the model to be stable by construction, give you a good insight of how to initialize them, and, and make them scalable. Uh, yes? Yeah, sorry. Uh, when you talked about the uh, input parameterization, you mentioned that uh, the initialization is just justified by the fact that uh, it's optimal uh, yeah. memorization with respect to some function. Yeah. Rate. In this case, we change a bunch of things. Now, if I initialize uh, this architecture that we have uh, up to this slide, what does the memorization properties of this look like? Right. So. Um... You can initialize it with people. I don't know if that was exactly your question, but you can take this system and initialize with people, and it was still going to work. The, the thing that we found with people was that even if you initialize with people, which in some sense is like the global, or it's like a minimum, right? It's like an optimal compressor. When you, when you start training the system, and that's what your original system paper did, you diverge from that. So somehow that didn't seem to be what the RNN actually wanted, even though. Um, what do the system do? Well, it depends on how you initialize them. So if you Pick this ring to be, um, um, I guess, kind of close to one, so something like point, from 0 0.9 to 0 0.9999 or something like that, um, and you have a reasonable length sequence. Uh, more often than not, you'll see that you can linearly decode the sequence, uh, but this is not a guarantee. So the way we initialize, like you, you know, it just empirically you see you can decode it because you kind of capture, you have these very long traces and, and, and you know, you, you have many random projections of, 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 of this and you can reconstruct it. Um, I don't think you can prove that sort of our initialization ensures that you can always reconstruct, but then that's why you have learning on top of it. Um, by the way, the way we initialize things um, is not necessarily super novel. Like if you look at state networks, I mean, that's all that they're talking about and they're also doing kind of exactly the same thing. Uh, so you just... Uh, uh, rehashing sort of the echo state network initialization. The only issue with echo state networks is that they're non nonlinear. So you don't actually you you hope you assume that the system is linear. You come up with this thing, but then the system is nonlinear, so it's not going to behave like that. For us, the system is exactly linear, so it's going to behave exactly like you you thought. Um, any any other questions?
Uh, so this is where I have the mistake. Uh, so I think many of you probably already spotted it, but um, yeah, the, the sloppy math does not work out. Um, but th there's a question that came up. So like when you start using these models for language, and this is what I'm going to go to right now, uh, one thing that comes up is that you don't need complex numbers. And the question is, why don't you need complex numbers? And when do you need complex numbers? Like the whole theory talks a lot about complex numbers. They come out of this diagonalization of your matrix. And what does it mean? So I still believe that the hypothesis is OK. The math is wrong. The hypothesis is that if you blow up your hidden state size, um, then you can represent what you could have represented with, with, with uh, complex numbers. So I think there's a way of correcting the math. So if you make the system to be A00A zero, zero, A transpose, now that becomes symmetric. And then if you multiply that with X0, then basically from that you can reconstruct exactly the same Y that you would have gotten from the original system that's AX. So if you take the system that has blown up the, the hidden space by a factor of two, so multiple, you know, twice as big hidden space, and then you have a projection from that to a space that's 1D. In this higher dimensional space, you can build a symmetric system that would give you the same sequence of Ys. Why does this matter? Well, the whole thing is if you diagonalize the symmetric matrix, you get real eigenvalues, so you don't have complex numbers. If the system is not symmetric, then you get complex numbers. So if you want to get rid of complex numbers, just need to make your linear recurrence symmetric. And the question is, can you, you know, if I blow up the dimension, can I make a non-symmetric into a symmetric one? I still believe it's true. This is still in the sloppy math space, but I'm sure if anyone wants to do this, they, they would be able to show one or another. Um, so that's one perspective. So, so what it says is like, do you need complex number? Well, complex number just helps you to have a very compact embedding, but if you don't care about the size of your hidden state, you can always get away with just real numbers by just blowing up the size of the model. And in practice, we always blow up the size of the model regardless of reason. So we, we can't even tell, you know, <laughs> that we needed complex numbers because we have big models. That's one, one reason. The second reason, which is a bit more tricky, and again, it's a hypothesis space, because of how complex numbers work with this rotation in the plane and how the SSM works. I'm not going to go into details, but I'm happy to talk afterwards. I think complex numbers are really good to give you positional encoding, but in language, the ordering of the words do not matter as much. It matters sometimes. Sorry, there's a question. Yeah, there is a question on my body. Uh, is the symmetric linear system causal? And can we use it for all purposes? Um, so recurrent by constructions are causal. So you could potentially use it for, for that. Um, I should, yeah, I hope that answers the questions. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, like uh, by by construction, recurrences are causal. Um, yeah, so sorry for my my second point was I I think that language uh, the the order of the words does not matter that much, particularly for English. English has this very strict structure that if I give you a bag of words, you kind of with high confidence can guess what the sentence was. You know, the adjective has to come in a particular order and so forth. So actually, knowing in which order the words came in, like the order of the token, is not that important for for language, and that's why you get away with, with real numbers because complex numbers really help you keep you track of the order of the tokens, which is not as important for this particular application. And like the places where people said that complex numbers don't matter tends to be language. Um, so, so yeah, so, and then this is what everyone says in their papers, you know, this is domain specific. If you're trying on something else than language, please try complex numbers because the theory says you should use complex numbers. Um, okay, I, what are we still missing? Kind of jumping ahead a bit. So one is, um, what is the difference to NSTs and GRU? The big difference that's still left that we haven't discussed, and it's gating, and as many of you already know, Mamba uses gating, and we use gating as well. So in the next phase, I'm going to talk a little bit about gating, uh, what's important. Um, are we good on the expressivity front? And here is like proof ends up being in the pudding. What I mean by that is, well, I'm going to show you some numbers of how well the systems work, so we scale them. So we, we actually run them on scale, and they seem to work well. And what matters at scale is something else that we're going to discuss. So um, let's go to language modeling with RNNs. So how did we do this? Well, we, um, you know, we wanted to keep things as close to the things that we know work. So you start with a transformer block. So this is an actual transformer block. And what we did in our architecture is we, the attention uh, part of the, of, the, of, the, of the transformer block, we replace it with a recurrent uh, sub-block. I think I'm using the word block everywhere. but. The big thing is the block, the, the other things are subblocks. So you have the MLP subblock and then you have the recurrent subblock. And the recurrent subblock looks like that. 
So uh, w one thing that's important when you start building the system that you're thinking about, like, oh, I want to, to, to build an LLM that, that works at scale and whatnot, is you have to start thinking about scalability from the beginning. If you if you just build a system and then you afterwards try to make it scalable, like you might run into trouble. So one thing that you need to start thinking about from the beginning is how you're gonna shard the system over devices. What is the strategy and what does that mean for the so in particular the kind of sharding we do, which I think a lot of people do, is this Megatron uh, sharding, which the sharding is over the um, hidden state. It's not over time, it's all over the uh, channel dimension, if you want. And then the way this, I mean, and this adds some constraints, right? If you, if you have any block that you want to shard, that block needs to have an even number of layers. And usually people like it to be two layers because then like things align very nice. So this graph here, I can I can walk you through at some point if anyone is interesting. This is sort of how the operations work and the blue is one device, the orange is the other device. And this shows that if you split the weight matrix this way and that way, then you never need to communicate between devices except at the end when you need to sum this Y1 and Y2. So you, you can compute them independently on each on its own device and then you sum them. I mean, you'll find this figure in the Megatron paper that talks only about sharding. Um, so the thing is you have to have this even number of linear layers and then anything else needs to be element wise or block sparse. So in particular, if we're looking at our recurrent block, it's the new thing that we introduced, like the MLP block that we have here already has an even number of linear layers. If you look on the depth, you know, because it, these things are parallel. So it just, we need to have the same for our recurrent block. So what it means for us is that everything that's in this red triangle, uh, sorry, red rectangle needs to be block sparse or shardable, uh, to be shardable, block sparse or, 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 or element wise. Uh, so that's sort of our restriction that we're working with. And then you have other questions like, okay, why do we have the multiplication? Um, and it's, it's hard to come up with really good reasons, but I, I've listed at least four things that come to mind. So first of all, this is what MLP does, right? So if you look at MLP block, like people have found the multiplication is very important. Like why would we do something different? So we just kept the multiplication because unit and then there was a three-way RBM and the, um, this mapping unit that I actually don't know about them because it was before me, but there is a long literature until the early 2000s about why this is important and it kind of died out and then it kind of appeared without people actually naming them what they are. You know, people like you have for, for, for vision people, you have the shift excite block that some people use that has multiple interactions. I mean, that's a very nice idea, but like that's not how it's being presented. Um, okay, so these are the two reasons. Third reason, if you look at this, you realize that what this additional path does, it actually gives you like an output gate. And we talked about gating being important. So when we go to the describing the LIU, it turns out that we don't need an output gate, but we probably don't need an output gate because we have it here. Where we, just, we didn't realize it was in the block, right? So it doesn't, it, it depends on where you draw the line. Um, and the fourth thing, this is an interesting argument. I'm not gonna go too deep into it, but there is this new line of work coming from people like Jürgen Spiegelberg and, and um, Joel Sacramento that are trying to connect SSMs to linear attention to something called fast wave programmers, which is sort of like an idea that you're going to propose in the 90s, probably, or something like that. And you can't connect these things unless you have this gating. And then this fast wave programmers is just sort of a way of how do you represent memory in, 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 in these kind of systems. Okay. Um, next bit. Okay, so that's why we have multiplication. Why do we have the com one d um, so for the comp one d the first reason is, well, that's what other people did. So the first paper is Hungry Hungry Hippo that introduces this comp one d this temporal long comp one d um, And then after that, basically any SSM paper kind of kept the comp one d because it worked very well, it, it helped empirically. And the reasoning in the, in the Hungry Hungry Hippo paper was that this comp one d grouped together tokens because there was a previous anthropic paper that showed that the first layer of a transformer tries to group pairs of tokens together to make kind of a data set from which you do like in context learning. So they said, oh, we need to have that here as well. So let's hard code it as a comp 1D and you hard code it and it helps. 
This is the first reason. So that other people have done it. The second reason is it seems that the linear RNN itself actually has a hard time to model very short term information for some reason. And whenever you train the system, then you look at the eigenvalues that you learn, they tend to be large, closer to one. And the system seems to have a hard time to really like disambiguate between the last three or four observations. So the comb one d kind of helps you by explicitly modeling the relationship between the very short term information. And the third thing is that this, the output of this comb one d is what goes into the gating. So now the gates have a bit of context when they made their decision. So if you use your gate to decide, do I care about this token or not? You might want to condition that on some past, and this pop one d gives you like a. So the pop one d usually has a kernel of size four, so it's not a big past; it's just the last four tokens, but it still gives you some context to make the decision. And then, like, what kind of linear and then to do? I I think the you know I think many things work. So we're going to focus on LRU, but I think other choices work as well. It does seem that gating actually helps quite a bit. Uh, so this is a little bit of, uh, I'm not sure how I'm spending this time, but this is a little bit of a repeat of what I said before. So this is how the linear recurrence looks. In general, this is the original introduced as S4. And again, linearity allows parallelization that might not, it might be a bit overestimated and um, allows you control, uh, to control the, the system to be stable and all of those stuff, because now you have direct access to your uh, Jacobian and to your um, eigenvalues of, of, of the Jacobian of your recurrence. Um, and yeah, parallelization can be done in many ways. So like RedNet has its own way of doing it that was different from the associative scan. Um, and the first step that everyone did is we moved the, the dense matrix to a diagonal one. The downside is they had to use complex algebra, but this reduces the number of flops. This allows things to be shardable. If I go back to the shardable discussion, we really needed the recurrence to be shardable. That, that means it has to be diagonal. Like we can't use the S4 block because that breaks the shareability. Like you can't use the Megatron shareability anymore. Uh, and the controllability. Okay, so this sounds all good. So now if I take this, plug in the S4D, or I could plug the LIU, and you're trying to see what happens when you do language, it turns out it's actually worse than SEM, <laughs> um, which was, uh, I mean, for some people, maybe it was a surprise. It turns out I, if I don't have it in the plot. And, um, maybe it's you know, a bit of grain of salt, with whether you believe me or not. But it turns out that STMs are actually as good as transformers. So I don't, I don't think there's a, all, ever a question of whether you know transformers do something magic that STMs can't do. It's just a, the fact that if I'm looking at these plots, you know, getting the LSTM curve takes 20x more compute than getting the S4D block. But you know, if you just take a linear and then the way we've described it so far, it seems to be doing worse. You add gating and then you do as well as LSTM because this was the main difference. And that's sort of the reason why we ended up with gating. Um, so how does the gating look? So this looks very ugly, but um, yeah, you can ignore some parts of it. So this is the formula of the LRU. So it's the one that we usually had. Maybe the important thing, uh, so this looks ugly, but it's exactly the stuff we've discussed before. The only novel thing here is the part of the, uh, on the left there, the, the input gate. So basically, you take XT and you multiply the input gate. The input gate is the same input gate you have in GRU, LSTM, and whatnot. It's the same thing, a sigma WXT plus B. The only difference from normal gating is that we don't, uh, the gate is not a function of HT minus one, it's just a function of the input. And the reason for that is if you make it a function of HT minus one, then you can't parallelize the scan anymore. Like this whole associative scan breaks down, and that's why no one does that. So that's the only difference that we had to do to LSTM. Um, we haven't done it because it's a good idea, just because you have to do it in order to keep things parallelizable. And then the other difference is you have this gate on the recurrence. And, and I think the tricky bit that we've done, maybe that's a bit more unorthodox, is we move the gating with inside the exponential. So now you can you can think of it as it's actually a gating, but you can also just think of it as a hyper network where you basically mm -hmm. uh, you have like, you know, it's uh, based on X, you decide what are going to be my recurrent weights. But but really it's, it's just a gating. And um, the difference to other existing gating, so like if you look at Mamba or if you look at GRU LSTM, like those things, they have something that is, feels more like an update or like a forget gate. So basically what the gate does, it allows you to interpolate between zero and the eigenvalue that you've learned. For us, the gating does the opposite. It allows you to interpolate between the eigenvalue that you've learned and one. Um, so for us, it's like exactly the opposite of a forget gate. It, it doesn't allow you to forget. It allows you to remember perfectly more if you want to. But in some sense, I don't know whether this really matters that much. 
maybe the better way to think about it is once you have this kind of gating mechanism, what it allows you is to like locally expand or contract time. So this is how this thing works. So if you look at your signal, you can locally make things move slower or faster <laughs> by, by changing the eigenvalues, right? You, you make the eigenvalues larger, you make the eigenvalues slow, slower. And, and this seems to be quite important when you model these things, it's probably because the amount of information is not uniform over the length of the sequence. So you kind of need to track a little bit, you know, how much detail is, is locally in the, in the sequence at that point in time. And sort of the gating allows you to do this dynamically. Um, ah, yes, a question. Can you actually see that when you do it? So, for example, can you see how I contracts or if you look at the um, I, I, I don't have plots like, I mean, I have plots. I have seen plots like that, and I think I've even generated plots like those for LSTMs. And for LSTM, because for LSTMs, I had this question. The original LSTM motivation was that the gate acts as a zero one thing, you know, closes the closes the box, opens the box. And I was like looking at the gate to see if that happens, and it doesn't. It's really like more of a continuous value that kind of, you know, moves from 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 one place to another. So I've seen this for LSTMs. We have not plot like what the gating does for this model, so I'm not sure, but I would assume it does something similar. Um, Okay, so this is okay. I, I know it's not a lot of info, but you know, you put all of this together, you get the model. So how does this work? So here we have a comparison. So we have two models. One is just the purely recurrent model, so just blocks that I described. The other one, which we call Griffin, is a mix where you have for every two recurrent blocks, you add a local attention block, and that's because we thought like, well, there's something about local attention that that's quite. It's something about attention that's quite interesting. I'm going to come back to that. When we do some kind of ablation a bit later. But the point is, if you just have recurrence, you get the, 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 the green curve on the top that's called Hawk, that's slightly worse, but it kind of shows the same kind of scaling loads that you'd expect. So this is going up to 14B for the last point, I think is 14B parameters. So this is medium size, I guess, by the new standard, but it's a little bit light. Yeah. Yeah, there's another online question oh. saying uh, is it necessary to have the recurrence weight input dependent? Um, as 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 compared to not being dependent on anything. Uh, yes, it's a yeah. constant parameter. So so yeah, so this is kind of this plot, right? So the S four D is the one that the the the, the recurrent gate was not. It's a it's a constant. It doesn't input. And then empirically, it it kind of works worse. Of course, like the thing is, and it matters a lot of what you care. Like the S four D, the one without gate, shows the same kind of scaling loads that the other ones do. So. You could always say I, I can add gate or I can make my model, you know, five billion parameters larger and I'm going to get the same performance. So it depends on what you care about. Like you can always compensate for any lack of expressivity by scaling the model more. But if you're just trying to compare models of the same size without gating, you perform worse. So it just adds a boost in expressivity. Okay. So, um, yeah, so, so, so the point here is that it works quite well. It scales quite well compared to, to strong transformer baselines. And in the paper, we have comparison with LAMA2 and, 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 and another thing. So, so it, we, we believe this kind of holds. And then you, you get this very fast inference because it's all one. So, so you get the big throughput and, and you know, computational benefits there. Um, do you know how much time I have? Yes, yeah, security is uh, 6 or 1. Uh, OK, I, I can try to finish it in 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Thank you. So I wanted, I, I had two more little sections that I think it's important. One is about ablation and sort of what happens in one context. And the other thing is about actually what happens when you implement this on device. And I think there's some things that at least for me, and I'm not too strong on the engineering side, there are some things that took me by surprise when we started looking at this because th th they're a bit counterintuitive, but maybe for some of you guys, it's already quite intuitive. Uh, so efficiency matter, you know, we have transformer, we have SSMs, we know they perform well. Theoretically, we have all of these claims that SSMs, you know, are all one at the inference and blah, blah, blah. So they should be performed quite well. Do they actually perform well in practice? Like is device efficiency? Um, and it is not a trivial to answer, right? It's the same, is, you know, all notation does not tell you how things are going to run on the device. And the reason for that is when you think about device, um, I mean, there are many things you need to think about, but like two things you can think about is flops versus memory bandwidth and, and the relationship between those. So, for example, if you take a TPU and a lot of stuff that we've done is on TPU, so this is kind of the structure of the TPU, but you'd get similar stuff if you look at the GPU. 
What you tend to have is you have this HBM, which is sort of the main memory where, you know, those are your gigabytes of memory that you have on the device. And then you have this VMAM and FMAM, and those are actually cache memory that are actually used when you're doing your matrix multiplication, LMIs multiplication, and more that. And, and if you look at the bandwidth between these things, uh, transferring from HBM to VMAM is like roughly 820 gigabytes per second. That sounds like a lot. But then when you look at the amount of teraflops that your um, vector processor can do, it turns out that actually that transfer is relatively slow. And from you know people who do this kind of things, they, they look at this transfer and they say, this is the slow one. And then there's another transfer from the VMAM to vector processor that's like 2.5 terabytes per second. That's considered fast and that's ignored. So you just worry about the main one, the, the 820 gigs transfer. So that's considered slow and that's considered bottleneck. So if you're looking at our diagonal RNN, I, I, yeah, anyway, if you're looking at diagonal RNN, you're thinking, oh, how, how does this work on device? You can think of the little program that does this, right? And what the thing would do would be something like, okay, load my XT, my recurrent weights, capital lambda, and my previous hidden state from HBM to VMAM, compute this formula above, so compute my new HT, and then push HT to H HBM. So this is sort of what you do. And what you need to do when you look at this is you need to look at like, okay, how much bytes am I transferring back and forth? And how many flops am I doing for those bytes? And it turns out that you're doing, you're spending 0 0.5 flops per byte uh, that you transfer. So what this means is that all of this computation is extremely memory bound. Like everything, like the only reason things are slow is because you're wasting time copying from one place to another. Um, we actually wrote a kernel, um, and part of our results is a specialized kernel, where the, thing, the, the, the main thing we did is we said, well, it doesn't make sense to keep copying HT from one place to another. You just keep it in, in, that, in the VMAM, you know, keep it, keep it in the cache. Um, and, you know, our calculation said that this should give you a speed of uh, improvement of 1.3, but it gave us a 4x speed improvement because devices are hard to understand. And, no, you assume something, you confuse something, but then when you do it, something else happens in practice. But it's really good news, right? So we got a kernel that's 4x speed up, and, and that was quite quite great. Um, and that's sort of how, how mainly sort of our code works. But the other thing that comes to mind is, okay, what about all of this parallelization that we've been talking about, like this associative scan and this sort of uh, retinet style of computing things that are supposed to help you a lot? So it turns out that these things are actually more of a red herring. They're, they're not that important. Because the thing is, parallelization, the only thing that can help you is to improve on the flops, and you are never bounded by the flops. You're always bounded by the memory transfer. So improving the flops will not help you with anything. It will actually make things worse, because if you do this associative scan, then you need to have this random memory access pattern that actually, at least for the TPU, is not very friendly. So, so you get actually much lower transfers from, from, from of memory when you try to do this random access. Those are the two technical reasons. And then the third technical reason that's kind of interesting and it maybe wasn't obvious to me either, is if you do associative scan or if you parallelize your scan, then you can't do accumulation of a different precision than your computations. So it, either everything is plot 32 or everything is plot 16. If you do it sequentially, you can keep your accumulator to have 32 bits and you do everything 16 bits and that helps you a lot. And what does this mean in practice? Well, it means in practice that if you do the simple sequential scan, just the for loop, it's the green one, it's way better. Associated scan is actually quite worse for this model. And in practice, we do not, we do not try to parallelize the, the linear element. It, we don't see any benefits, we just see like the downside to it. And the second thing is, if you try to do all your computation with float 16, which is what you kind of have to do if you do the associative scan, you get huge amount of error, accumulative error in your computation. Um, well, if you just keep the accumulator at float 32 and do everything with float 16, it works quite well. Uh, so that's kind of like a, an additional boost for us because now when you're copying things, you have to only copy float 16, right? So you're like dividing by two the amount of stuff you need to copy. And as I said, memory bound is, is all that matters. So, so this is maybe like an interesting, I don't know, for people who like engineering, this may be an interesting observation, is that we have all of these claims that, oh, this is, you know, reduces the amount of computations you need to do or whatnot, but that doesn't matter. Really, it's like the memory boundness is all that matters, and all you want to do is reduce the amount of memory you need to copy. 
The other point is um, the reason people are excited about this is because it's faster the inference. I'm not going to go over the numbers. Yeah, it, it, the inference is, is faster. I just wanted to highlight again another thing that I found surprising, which is we talk about inference again in terms of computation. It's like O1 versus ON or whatever. It turns out that inference in LLMs is memory bound. Flops don't matter. Again, the only thing that matters is how much you have to copy from one place to another. And the only reason the SSM is doing is better at inference than the transformer is because the cache that the SSM needs to carry over is just, or the RNN, I should call it RNN. The cache that the RNN needs to carry over is just a hidden state. While the transformer is the KV cache, which is way bigger. So it's a, like a, you know, the numbers are there, are, are there. So the KV cache is, has a size of something like N times T times D, while the RNN cache is something like N times 3 times D. So if T, which is the sequence length, is large, then that cache is much bigger than the other. So anyway, I just thought this is kind of interesting, the fact that everything is memory bound, nothing is flop bound. So any idea that like saves you flops is not useful. You need to think about things that save you memory. <laughs> So that's the only thing that seems to matter. Then how well does it work? And this is kind of going back to ablation and maybe a little motivation of why we added the local attention. I mean, this came after the fact, but anyway, you could think of it as a motivation of why we used local attention. You can look at how well the system generalizes on longer sequences after training, right? So uh, maybe on the last plot, on the top last plot there, uh, where we just look at Griffin and Hawk. So what we're looking there is like what happens if you train the model, we say like 2K context, and then you test it on books that are very long, that are like, you know, a million on token. And you want to see how well they can make use of this longer context that is somehow relevant for what you're doing. And you can see that it, it actually is able to, right? So the system that it's trained on 2K context, it can generalize up to 8K context and then it kind of breaks. And the one that's trained on 8K context maybe can go to like 32K context and you still see an improvement. So, so basically it's just saying that the system can make use of longer context. You know, it's not like it was trained for this length and only works for this length. It actually generalizes a little bit to longer length. But if you look at the bottom row of plots, what this shows, this is checking for things like, can you tell me the phone number of John from like a phone book or something like that? So this is exact retrieval, right? Finding the needle in the haystack. And here, like, I don't know, maybe for some people, I mean, it shouldn't be super surprising, but here, like the um, RNN based models just break. And that's kind of obvious because the way the RNN works, they have this information bottleneck. Everything has to go into the hidden state. So if you just have to memorize random numbers, there's no way of compressing them in a hidden state. So, so this kind of breaks quite quickly. Um, and maybe the phone book lookup. So, you know, like if you compare, so the, 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 the green line that you can't see very well, that just drops to zero immediately. That's just a pure RNN model. So it just can't deal with this. But then if you add local attention, it seems you can deal with this to the length of your local attention. And then you start seeing degradation because, you know, you can't, search back. So local attention time gives you this window of, 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 of retrieval if that's very important to you. And that's sort of maybe one thing or one reason why Griffin is tends to do better because I think, and I, maybe you guys know better, but I feel that a lot of the evaluations that we tend to do for language is heavily relies on retrieval because we don't know how to test memory. So it's always retrieval. So can you remember the name of this person or that? But we don't really test for yeah, like reasoning over very long sequences that somehow integrate information over that sequences. So that's why like retrieval plays a big role in the final number that you had when you when you do this evals. Sorry. Yes. Uh, you said, yeah, like as you said, after the need of local attention, we see the gradation in performance, but why does in performance go as badly as with the standard RNN? Um, not exactly sure. Um, I mean, the, the local attention is like 1K, and then by 2K, it's 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 like decreased quite badly. Um, maybe, um, I mean, it could also be an issue of like learning. Um, so, so maybe like the fact that you have the local attention that helps you do retrieval kind of, it's, it's a bit more informative when you do the training for how to use your, your uh, recurrent state as well to compress a bit longer. Um, basically what happens, so this is the weird thing with RNNs when you train them, I, maybe it's something I can explain. Um, like in order to train an RNN, in order to learn about correlation between two events, you first of all need to have those two events, access to them, to for gradient descent to find them. So if at initialization, 
somehow you don't have that information because you know you're just trying to store everything and everything gets overwritten then you can never discover that there is any kind of structure in the data because you don't really see the events um so, so there is like a bootstrapping process to RNN. So you want RNNs to have very long memory at the beginning so that they can figure out what's relevant and then they will focus. I mean, potentially for this phone book, you know, you, maybe you can compress quite a bit of it in your state if you know what you're meant to compress and what's important and what's less important. But initially, when you don't know anything, you kind of need to keep track of everything in order to kind of figure out how, how to deal with it. And that could, could play, play a role. Um, yeah. Uh, I question. Maybe I wanted to say another thing because I realized we didn't put it in the paper. I'll try to correct that in the paper. But uh, maybe it is clear to people. But like when you train these models, you know, you always use L2 because that's what people do. Never apply L2 to the recurrent weights because you know the recurrent weights have a lot of semantics. And like if you apply L2, it means forget everything very quickly. So that's going to break your memory immediately. So when you train these models, you apply L2 to everything except the recurrent weights. <laughs> But the semantics of L2 and the current ways make no sense, and you shouldn't you shouldn't do that. But yeah, with that, thank you. Any third questions? Happy to answer them. I'd be happy to do the mic running. So if you'd like to ask questions, just raise your hands and I will be dropping the mic down. So I was intrigued by what you said early on about uh, your hypothesis about RNNs having contractive man, and that that's why um, what you end up learning might be taken from a subset that isn't during the beast. Can you just tell me why you think those maps are contractive? Uh, it's because if they're not contractive, then you're going to have exploding gradients and like just learning will diverge. So I think just the, the SGB process, the backdrop through time, like when you when you train it, like it forces you to stay very close to contractive maps. If, if you expand maybe a little bit, but not much because so it, it, expanding is also wrong, right? But you but like in your in your example, the initialization of the eigenvalues, yeah. you actually there were good reasons to be very close to that one yeah, normal very, eigenvalue, it, right? So is is that not where you sort of want to be? Or is that no, also no, 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 like you can you can think of it differently. Like the fact that Eigenvalues are always smaller than one. It means you can only have paid memory. So any information that you get, there exists a time t at which that information will disappear. And that t is independent of your input of everything. It's, it's just an architecture specific. So if I'm thinking of a Turing machine, I have a tape where I can write a bit of information and I can keep it there for how many time steps I want. You know, I, I can, you know, you can tell me a number of steps and it can tell me a bit of information and I can store that bit of information for that number of steps. I mean, it is trivial to call the Turing machine that can do that. But the SSM will not be able to execute that Turing machine because there exists a T after which the information has to disappear because the eigenvalue. Yeah, uh, I guess what, what I mean is like, do you think that getting arbitrarily close to an eigenvalue of one is enough or is that still not enough? Um. I, I don't know. It's a hard question. I want to say that it's not enough, but it's a bit hard to, to justify that. Uh, if I, I feel like what you want is you want to have the flexibility to, um, to have like eigenvalues that go above one and then, you know, like maybe shrink later on. Like if I'm thinking of the execution of an algorithm, like this all comes like all this during completeness. Usually only is meaningful when, if you think of, I'm going to take this system and I'm going to use it as a compiler that is supposed to execute algorithms. And, and basically the question comes now, like, can you, is it true that if I think of any algorithm that we care about, are they always acting as a contraction in some space? And it's hard to me to, to, for me to believe that that's true. I mean, maybe someone knows better uh, and maybe there are classes of things like dynamic programming or whatnot that you can always write to some kind of contraction on some space. But I'm pretty sure that if you take all the algorithm as a whole, you can find one that does not act as a contraction, but it has some kind of weird behavior. And then that's like at that point you can't do that algorithm. There is a deeper question. So I had this question as well, like talking to some people where they were saying that like I'm over obsessing about Turing completeness and actually like the algorithms we care about, there's like it's a much more restricted class of algorithms and Turing completeness is like a red herring that no one really cares. It's a sort of the biggest class you can think of, and you know, there's a lot of garbage there that no one cares. But I don't know what class do we care about then. Like, can, can we come up with okay, these are algorithms we really care about, and 
Um, um, and this becomes important when you know people go into the, the direction of saying like, oh, LLM can do reasoning and cause. I mean, reasoning, causal reasoning, any of this is just executing some algorithm in the in the in the background. So, to do any of those, you need to be able to execute certain families of algorithms. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah. So, uh, hold on a sec. Just ah, okay. Thank you. So, uh, just just one very very quick one. Did I get correctly that then the the convolutional view was actually not uh, what you use in practice. No, and I, and I think like no one is using it anymore. And the issue for that is it does feel like this. Um, uh, sorry. It does feel like this kind of gating, um, uh, gated uh, SSM style architecture is getting it, it, the kernel networks do perform better. And once you add the gating, you can't try the kernel anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so it breaks. Yeah, so that's why people don't use it. But then this is really just uh, RNNs. Yeah. In the end, so it's just yeah. looping up RNNs. So, so yeah, I mean, back. that's that, that's what I I mean. That, that's what I would like people. I mean, I would like to get rid of the SSM name, just call them RNNs, yeah. and just say it's just like the class of linear RNNs. I, that would be ideal for me. But there are people would fight that. And uh, kind of you know, based on that, uh, I I'm also not uh, good uh, at control theory. Or anything. Yeah. But I I think that I remember that uh, there's also in addition to these. Uh, state space systems uh, that were in continuous time, you can also just find them in, in discrete time directly. And there's a different kind of uh, theory of the, the of the eigenvalues oh, okay. uh, that influence the, the result there. So you don't you don't you know have continuous and discrete as it's more of a, a parallel construction where it's discrete from the start. I don't know if that was ever. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I think that sounds quite interesting. I mean, I think it's worth looking um, into that. I, like someone else pointed out to me, but I forgot what they're called. Some kind of polynomial, blah, blah, harmonic. Poly I don't know what, it, but, but there is another way of like basically parameterizing your eigenvalues. So mm -hmm. they get sort of this kind of periodic behavior. And then like if you integrate that over time, somehow it's stable, but then locally the system can be unstable or stable because it changes. But the way these things evolve has to come from some kind of formula or whatnot to ensure that if you integrate them over the entire thing, the whole system becomes stable. So it feels like there's this whole world of, of things that people have thought of in, in control theory that would be nice to port here and see what happens when we play with them. But I haven't seen any paper doing that, I, I think. We, be interesting to see how I can like it. Uh, I just figured out I think this one is dead. So people please use your singing muscles and project. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. Uh, maybe it'll be something where you don't care about the parallelization. Yeah. Why do you need linearity and please put your signal with your variable data thing? That's a yeah, yeah. So that that's a very good question. I'll repeat it in case the people online can't hear. So the question is, if we don't care about parallelization, then why don't we make it back to nonlinear and stuff like that? I think making it nonlinear would be a big mistake, and that's because like the linearity also helps you with like controlling the system and and then parameterizing it. So as soon as you make it nonlinear, you lose that. Um, and I think that's basically important also like the whole diagonalization stuff doesn't make sense so like if i have a, a dense uh, uh non-linear recurrent model that doesn't mean that exists a, a diagonal non-linear system that represents that one like you can't show that equivalence anymore so the diagonalization again exploits the linearity um i don't know about the gating so the gating like we made the gating the way it is because we were worried about parallelization um, you could make the gating to be a function of HT minus one, I think. You'll need to write your own special kernel to make sure that things work the way they should. Um, I don't know. No one tried. I don't know. My, my word. There's one question online from Madi again. Uh, so, is efficient for birds without using SSM and LRU with uh, only using data adaptive convolution? And there's an eye uh, Do we really need SSM for birds? Um, I mean, we don't need it. It's just a, another option, but you don't. Uh, I mean, there are ways that there's like, uh, I don't know if that's a, what the paper refers to. So you have things like universal transformers and whatnot that are trying. Basically, they make transformer into a recurrence where the the the, the, the transition function from T to T plus one is basically like a transformer block of sorts. So that's kind of the idea of universal transformers. I opened the paper. It's his paper called ORCID called Flexible and Data Dependent Convolution for Sequence Modeling. 
Okay, I, I, I don't know that word, unfortunately. Yeah. But I mean, there are hybrid, there are other kinds of hybrid recurrent transformer models. Um, I, yeah, it's, I, I think we don't, I, I think what this line of work is trying to do is trying to get people to think of alternative architectures and transformers, but I don't think it's at the point where it's trying to claim that, you know, you should use this instead of transformer. Like, but I mean, even in our model, right, we use local attention because it does something that the SSM can't do, right? So the, and goal might end up being some kind of hybrid or, you know, maybe there are specific applications where you don't need attention, but there are others where you really need attention. So, so it's not that I'm not trying to sell this as a replacement, but just as an alternative and showing that there are other things that can do impressive things besides attention. Um, any more questions? Yeah. Are there any more dead ends you didn't mention? Oh, um, dead ends. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. So, okay, so there's the L2 thing that, that I think, you know, people can, can find it surprising. Um, hyper tuning the, 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 the uh, optimizer for your SSM is, is important. I don't think you should use the same hyperparameters you'd had for the transformer. Um, and when you hyper tune, don't just look at learning rate. Like if you use Adam, look at like the beta ones and beta twos as well, and all of those stuff because they do matter sometimes. Um, trying to think if there is other stuff that are important. Um, no, I, I, I don't. I mean, the only thing I would say is once you know, like you should, yeah, like if you really want to to get numbers as good as like existing large uh, LLMs like Mumbai and whatnot, don't underestimate the amount of tuning you'll need to do. Like people, when they do these things, they do tend to tune things quite carefully. Um, in particular, I think in our paper, I mean, I don't know if this is true or not, it's really hard to tell that there's so many moving parts, but for example, in our paper, we we got better numbers than Mamba for, for less, we don't know if that's just because we've tuned our system more than, than Mamba tuned, tuned their model. It could be that that's the only difference. I mean, we did find that in other like scenarios at smaller scale, like you could potentially, you know, replace the LRU with an S4D and you, if you tune it independently, you'd get the same number. So I don't believe that there is some like super magic sauce in the LRU parameterization that say the S4D is missing, I mean, except the gating, the gating, you know, has to be there, but then all of these things can have the gating. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, yeah. So one, one follow yeah. question, how much do you um, adapt like the optimization parameters throughout training? Or do they just set them off and go, or are people like looking at bots? So what you typically do is you you made this. I mean, I I personally don't like them, but this is how the community works right now. You, you make this kind of small scaling laws. Um, you know, you look at different hyperparameters. So you look at small scale, uh, different sizes, and you look sort of how hyperparameters evolve for that, and then from that you extrapolate, and then when you get to the big models, like say if you want to run like a seven B, I mean big for for us, not. Big in general. I, mean, I guess people will call this small to medium models or whatever, but for us, 7B is, is, is big enough. You know, that's more of a like run it and that's it. You know, you extrapolate you got some numbers. And then the only thing you can afford to do is what people call overtraining, which to me is like a complete misnomer. So basically, the only, the, 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 it, it, it seems that all the scaling laws like severely underestimate how many updates you need to do to converge. So you always underfitting heavily. So you can always afford to overtrain. And then overtraining is more about like, oh, I want this model to have it in a week. Okay, how much can I wait? You know, and then how much how much updates? And then update the, the learning rate schedule to that budget, and that's it. So you know, you decide the overtraining. But overtraining is always the more you do, the better you get. So it's more like can I afford to do this amount of overtraining or not? Um, people usually say that Chinchilla optimal. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the, the starting point, but like Chinchilla heavily underestimates the number of updates. So I've heard of people overtraining like 40X and stuff like that, and it still doesn't overfit. So you're still like underfitting. So we just like, for these models, we just really stop them very early in training. As a proof. I have one high level question. Yeah. Um, so I think, 
like quite uh, evident from from uh, this direction that I think most of the up upgrades and the uh, improvements are coming from fitting more the hardware, like finding where's the bottleneck in the hardware and finding better architectures that can actually utilize TPUs, for example. Yeah. yeah. And my question would be like, if you have a fixed budget, like you're the CEO and you, you have a fixed budget, do you spend it on hardware research to do uh, alignment with the trust from architecture and speed them up? Or do you spend uh, more money on, on the research scientists to come up with better architectures on the software part that fit better the hardware architecture? So, so when, when you mean, uh, can you repeat like the first part, like on the hardware in what sense? Did you mean that? Like you can, you can you optimize the hardware to fit the transfer market that shows a bit better. But, but I, I, okay, so I, I, I'm not expert yet, but, but I know like the cycle for hardware improvement is extremely slow. It's like at least a couple of years or more in proposing like a, an alternative structure of the, and then, you know, like this, this like, you know, new GPUs that come online, you know, the, the design for them, it's, like two years old or more when they started. Like this is a very slow cycle, so it's it's hard to say, oh, I'm gonna adapt my hardware to the model that I have. You're better off adapting the model to the hardware that exists. Um, and even once you get the chip, you know, getting it into production and getting enough of those devices, that can take time. I mean, that requires planning a lot of time, and it's way more expensive than saying, oh, I'm just gonna change my software to fit whatever hardware I have my system, which is Maybe unfortunate, but that's how, how things work. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, uh, if there are no more questions, then please put your hands together again. Yeah.